First thing before we get started, I know some of you guys haven't been in here before, and I just wanted to let you know there's restrooms down the hallway here and around this wall, and we've got water in the fridge if any of you guys need it. And I want to say thanks everyone for coming, but uh, mainly I want to say yeah, volunteering their time to do this for us and help uh, bring some knowledge and education to all of us, which I think we all want, obviously. So uh, this is Dr. Dye or uh, Dr. Diane Savell, and she's uh, been crossfitting how many years now? Uh, four and a half years. Four and a half years. So uh, it's pretty awesome to have someone who's in the industry that she's in doing what we do. So uh, I think that helps us hear her speak, right? Because we all speak the same language. So um, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? And oh, okay. Um, well, I'm an orthopedic surgeon at Springfield Clinic. I specialize in knee and sports medicine. And I play collegiate basketball and also a little bit of volleyball and track. So I've been, had my share of some injuries, but uh, mostly fun. And um, so I've learned a lot over the years from my athletes, from my patients, from my fellow um, competitors. Yeah. And uh, it's all about staying healthy and doing the right thing. And I've also learned from CrossFit because I thought I was you know, in pretty good shape until Mike pointed out these flaws. <laughs> and um, I, I think it's so important to do not just what you enjoy doing over and over. You've got to do different things. You've got to work different muscle groups. And we get into problems when we use the thing, same things over and over. So um, that's what I do. Awesome. Cool. So uh, I'm sure most of maybe about half of you guys have probably met Diane or seen her before. And uh, maybe if you guys haven't got to personally meet her yet, make sure and say hello and get to know her a little bit and then we'll do a little intro with you guys too. Yeah, I, I'm Brenda Clayton. Uh, I'm physical therapist with, with Springfield Clinic. Um, I'm actually more of a upper extremity specialist with shoulder and elbow, but I treat everything, um, the lower extremity and so what, what we're talking about today in the back. Um, so I graduated from Illinois State, undergrad exercise science, and then went to Bradley for my doctorate in physical therapy. And um, I was also a collegiate athlete so got into um, a lot of athletes, and that's what I specialize also is in the athletes in the clinic. Um, but uh, I, I have done some CrossFit. Um, I've done a couple of competitions, but don't uh, completely do it all the time or anything, but I do emulate a lot of my workouts like that, so that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yes. Uh, so, yes. Yes. So my name is I'm an athletic trainer with Springfield Clinic. Um, I'm a Redbird as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm an athletic training. I, know. Um, I am at the high school <laughs> level, so primarily working with high school athletes, I do a lot of injury evaluation, um, injury um, rehab, and that sort of thing with the high school kids. So I'm there every day, you know, covering games, seeing injuries, and then referring them to Dr. Dye, of course. Um, and then just working with kids on just injuries in general, but then also injury prevention. And that's one of my big points today is why do injuries occur and then how do we stop them? So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming, guys. Yeah. So we're going to use a little PowerPoint, and our only issue is the cord is not quite long enough, so one of us is going to be on the floor at all times. <laughs> so a little flexibility, right? We're working yeah, right. on the right. flexibility. Um, so we can go to that next slide we've done our introduction. So our objectives today, we're going to hit a little bit of the anatomy involved. Um, we're going to talk about some injuries and overuse and conditions, which a lot can be prevented, what we can do about it. Um, we're going to recognize some of the evaluation and testing methods that we use and some of the exercise protocols. And, and well, they're changing out um, to their <laughs> I can take some questions right now. And I have a question. Yes, Tim. Yeah, real quick. I was just uh, interested in the ball and socket of yes. the femur. Yes. Is that ever like, like genetic? Is that ever just like shaped different and cause hip pain for people? So the question was, does the ball and socket ever uh, congenitally or um, are they born with abnormalities or is it shaped differently? Has it caused a problem? And the answer is definitely yes. Um, there is There are varying... Um, Differences in the depth of the socket is one. So if somebody has a little bit of dysplasia of the hip, they may have a little less coverage. There's also a condition called femoral acetabular impingement, or FAI, which has come into vogue probably in the last 10 years in orthopedics, where we know that there can be sort of a bony impingement that occurs on the hip. And 
in the neck. So sometimes structural problems can be an issue, and it could lead to, there's a, almost like the meniscus of the hip, but it's a labrum. It's a, a cartilaginous thing that deepens the hip. So if you have that pinching going on, it can tear that labrum. So there are anatomical things, and actually, there's also anatomical things that can limit your ability to do a deep squat. So sometimes you aren't going to get as deep as your neighbor because your anatomy is different. So we can work within our available range and not necessarily have to have surgery to correct all these things, but um, to identify that it is there and work within our range. Uh -huh. Yes. Uh, sometimes you see people that you mentioned being like not lead. Yes. That's the way they That's always the way. worked. You know, you saw them when they were small. Yes. Did they, or when somebody stands, their knees go back, you know? Yeah. Like, like, a, like that? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. 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 So, is that, were they like born that way? Or did they work it that and yeah. get that way? Sure. <laughs> Did everybody hear that question? And that's what I need to repeat it for No, them. I think that's good. Um, the answer is yes, some people do have, are they born that way or, or developmentally even as they grow? There are some people whose bony anatomy, so even when they're standing stable on both legs, they're kind of like this. Mm -hmm. And if we look at their x-rays, there's some bony valgus. That you really can't correct with training. You can still keep those muscles strong so that it doesn't do more and, and if they're kind of a setup. But some things we'll even look at their shoe alignment because we can help that a little bit with orthotics and get them a little bit better arch to kind of give them, uh, get them out of that valgus. Um, the, the extension you mentioned, some people's knees go backwards. Mm -hmm. Again, that can be a bony problem, even a, a soft tissue. Some people have more laxity. Their elbows hyperextend, their knees hyperextend. They they can touch their. I'm not. I'm not very mm -hmm. flexible. But you know those hypermobility. Things. We can't necessarily change that, but we can very well compensate the muscles around those joints to protect it, to make it as safe as possible. So, does that answer the uh -huh. question? Yes. So you talked a little bit about the gluteus, uh, medius and minimus. Uh -huh. You talked a little bit about like uh, greater trochanteric pain syndrome and how that comes into it. Yes. So the greater trochanteric, let me show you the hip here. Greater trochanteric is, this is the bump on the bone where the great, that is the greater trochanter. The gluteus medius comes right here and attaches to that, also the minimus. And when they are weak and your hip does this all the time, you can imagine it's sort of like a rubber band always under tension so you can get irritation there. When the IT band is tight, and I think yeah, so we'll talk a little bit more, but briefly, you can get a sort of a friction syndrome there where that is coming across, and there's actually sometimes a surgery necessary, very rarely, usually it can be corrected with, with surgery. But so you've got a bursa here, which is a natural cushion. We have bursas on the front of our knee, on our shoulder, our elbow, but that bursa can get very inflamed. The IT band can also, where it attaches down here, same kind of muscle group up here, but that big old band that we saw and it can be friction here also. So that, that's another thing that can occur. But usually weakness and also some tightness in that band. So, yes? Uh, to piggyback off what Tim said, if you have a labral tear or both labral tears, what's, I mean, what's the next step? Do you just try to build the muscles up around that or do you, is surgery kind of your only option? <laughs> surgery is not the only option. A lot of times flexibility, capsular, mm -hmm. and are you gonna talk about things a little bit of that? with a uh, hip flexibility and oh, yeah. specific. Mm -hmm. But, um, so Brittany's gonna show some things, but um, <laughs> sometimes an injection would be necessary for pain control. Flexibility, mobility, um, joint mobilization, even in the face of labral tear. Surgery is kind of the last option. So if there have been studies that show similar to a knee, if you MRI everybody, you're gonna see some meniscus tears and when they're symptomatic and causing mechanical problems and when they fail, conservative treatment then surgery but it's surgery should be the last option for a label turn not the first so does that answer your question yep all right <laughs> anyway, I gotta, I gotta switch and then we'll take a whole bunch more questions at the end too for august okay. yeah. <coughs> okay.
It always makes me laugh and makes me feel better. Like, oh, hey, my hips are a little bit more. They always can cause a lot of uh, strain on the lower extremity because it is truly a kinetic pain. Um, and we'll, like I said, we'll go a little bit more in depth with that. And then faulty joint mechanics, which, again, kind of the hip impingement stuff we were talking about. If you have a patient or a, or a person that has had a total knee, um, that, you know, they're right now they have faulty joint mechanics, like their knee is not going to bend as much as the other knee. And, you know, it's, that's just the way it is. And so, you know, just ways that you're going to have to program the CrossFit to you. Like, well, maybe I can't get that far because my right knee doesn't go that far. So I'm not going to try to do that. Um, uh, mostly the faulty joint mechanics I see a lot is with shoulder, um, you know, that most people I, I have a two-year-old, and when she was a baby, I held her all the time like this when in bed. So I have a faulty joint mechanic that I can't, you know, get my shoulder past a certain point versus this side. And so, I mean, it's just the capsule side and that kind of thing. It's faulty joint mechanics, so that's going to cause an imbalance between the two sides. And then um, it, it's it's one of the basics, but the, why do we lose for a warm up or cool down is one of my biggest things because you hear a lot about warming up and cooling down, but you, you're not always doing it right. So. so you, you know, the old school thought was you get out there to warm up and you sit in a circle for 10 minutes and you stretch all your muscles and you're like, oh, okay, I'm good. And you go try to squat a thousand pounds and it doesn't work out, right? Um, so then, um, and I'm seeing it more and more, especially at the high school level, a lot of the athletic trainers I've been talking to, coaches are starting to come to us and say, okay, we saw, a, you know, 50% of our kids had ankle injuries last year, why? So we're starting to develop more better warm-ups that don't just include static stretching. So we all know how to static stretch. You know, you, you lay down, you stretch your hamstring. But you're including a lot of dynamic movements in it, getting your heart rate up, um, and just moving instead of just that static stretching. So that's one of my biggest things, um, especially among high school kids that don't like to listen. They just think they can go out and play basketball for two hours without ever moving. Um, so that's one of my biggest things, um, is no warm up or cool down. And then cool down, you know, they finish, and then you're just done, and you walk out of the gym and you go home, not knowing that you should probably be stretching some, you should be moving a little to decrease your heart rate after all of that and move on from there. Um, so I don't know if you can add that. But then um, the second biggest thing is just the improper technique. And that's the thing I harp on the most. Um, I know I said no warm up was one of my biggest things, but that moves right into improper technique. So you don't warm up and then you go out here and you just think you know how to do it or you weren't educated properly or whatever the case is that you're not doing it right. And I know Dr. Dye looked at it a lot earlier. Um, and a lot of it, especially lower extremity, is with the knees and holding that proper movement. So especially, and we talked about the females being more at risk, but they, you know, you ask them, okay, jump off the chair for me. And they're like, okay, I got this. And they start to jump up and those knees come in. And then if you land and then they come together again, like, oh yeah, I got that. I do this all the time. And you know, that's not the proper technique. So um, just learning the proper way to do it and then just being consistent with that. And we talked about earlier about um, being able to, you know, get the feedback, looking at yourself in a mirror and then seeing, okay, can I do this the right way? You look at yourself in the mirror and you're like, okay, I can squat and hold this for a second, but can you do that consistently? Can you do it 30 times in a row without starting to drop and, you know, getting those muscle imbalances and your hips start to drop and go, wait, I can't do that 30 times in a row with no weight. How do I do that 30 times in a row with weight? So. Um, that was my other biggest key. And then, yeah, with the improper technique, and like we were going back to that research with CrossFit, they really harp them about the trainer. And so they say, like, actually, a lot of with CrossFit that people are, are um, the trainers are actually well knowledgeable and everything about the technique. And so that makes sure that someone's around um, most of the time that somebody else, there's another eye watching you, and that they are knowledgeable about that because that was like the biggest thing. Um, from what I learned from the research, so. So then, um, another re uh, a big one is too much too soon. So you're a beginner, you're coming in, you don't know exactly what you're doing. You're like, okay, I see this person doing this, so I'm gonna try to emulate it. And not knowing your individual um, limitations on what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing, what you can do, what you can't do. Um, so just getting over eager. And there's a, there's a certain point where getting over excited can be a good thing. You're like, oh, you know, I wanna get in shape. So you get out there and then you think you can go out and run 10 miles. So um, just doing too much too soon was a big one. And that's, then, uh, that's actually my one of my, <laughs> the first time I ever did a CrossFit workout, like coming off of being a college athlete, I just wanted to, someone just beat my butt, you know, just like kill me with a workout. So I, I did a CrossFit workout and I just went balls to the wall and um, couldn't move my, 
my elbows, like I couldn't straighten them, straighten them for a week. So, and then, you know, like, so I just, like, it just all of a sudden doing this presentation, I remember that. I was like, so I asked my assistant, I was like, do you remember that? Because you had to ultrasound my elbows every single day to get them to straighten, and they were so swollen, you know. But no one, but it, you know, and, and to be completely honest, I was at a gym that was not a CrossFit gym, I was doing a CrossFit workout at a gym, and so no one, no one told me, like, okay, like, you know, you're not, you haven't done 15 pull-ups in a row in a really long time, you probably shouldn't be doing that, and so, um, not to mention, like, hips and pull-ups, so, uh, yeah, so too much too soon, huge, huge deal, and then not enough rest, you know, that's, um, we're actually hitting upon that, too, and that, oh, that's a, a huge part that we don't really talk about, I mean, but it's so big, um, it's not just about the mechanics of your body and stuff, but are you getting enough sleep, you know, so that your body has that time to heal? More probably an issue with our teenagers and that kind of thing, but, and then nutrition is just like, you know, uh, major, and I know that you guys do a lot of nutrition stuff in here, and that's fantastic, because your, your body needs that to heal too, your muscles need that protein and that kind of thing to, to heal, I mean, get well, my patients well, I have muscle cramps and stuff every evening and the potassium and magnesium which is kind of out of my scope of practice but still major major um it's majorly important for for healing so and yeah just to harp on that last point I know it's just a definition you know any injury such as tendonitis or stress fracture that's caused by repetitive trauma and it could be you have your acute versus your chronic injuries, and I know that I talked a little bit about that. Your acute injuries are the ones that we can't really prevent, so you know you drop the weight on your foot, break foot, can't do anything about that. Uh, but the overuse injuries, when you're doing, and this is more so when you're doing a lot of the same movements all the time and never taking the proper rest. So um, you know the ones I, I thought of are like Achilles tendonitis, you've got your stress fracture, um, plantar fasciitis can be overuse if you're not taking the, the proper rest, you're not stretching right, that sort of thing. Um, and then, so just doing too much activity over time without rest could lead to that. And then the other point being, it, it's become a bad, it's on the rise is what I think I meant by has become a bad term recently because we're seeing a lot more overuse and you might be able to speak to that more than I can. Um, but just not taking the proper rest. So like in the case study that I thought of, which I'm dealing with right now, this has been an issue this last week. Um, at the high school level, I've got a division one soccer player. She's still in high school, but she's committed to play division one soccer. She um, just does way too much all the time, never takes forever. So she does basketball year round, she does soccer year round um, with the club and the AU that I talked about. And then she also does it for the school. So she literally never takes time off. And then she's also doing CrossFit. So I asked her, you know, this week I said, you know, give me an idea week for you. So she does basketball six days a week, and that's practices and games. Um, soccer, she's doing three days a week practice, one day a week games. And they're always on Sunday. So that's the one day that I'm like, take Sunday off. Yeah. And she's like, I can't have a soccer game. And then I was like, okay, so then what do you do on top of that? And she's like, I go across it three or four days a week. Okay. I'm like, okay, so then let's think about this. You, um, last year she had a really bad knee injury. She didn't have to have surgery, thank goodness. But um, she dealt with the injury all year. And she still wears a knee brace to this day. And it's been over a year because it hasn't had the proper time to heal, right? Um, and then recently she's had really tight hamstrings and she's had a lot of back pain. And she comes to me every day and she's like, my back's killing me. And I'm like, Take some days off, you know, like that would probably help, right? Um, and then recently, just this last week, she sprained her ankle. And I'm like, okay, you know, it's not fractured, thank goodness, but you're just doing way too much and not taking the proper rest. So she's in a boot now, and I'm like, thank you, you know, thank goodness this is going to give you the week off that you need. So maybe you can suck to your ankles hurt now, but we can give you the proper, you know, rest you need. So just the overuse and just that mentality of I never want to take a day off and she wants you know to exceed to excel at the highest level but she doesn't think she needs days off and we all need days off so so then my biggest question with preventing injury is um, you know you got to address why do injuries occur and then we kind of went through that now so then those injuries that do occur especially the preventable ones how do we prevent them so again, addressing those asymmetries, and so how, you know, how do you? I know Dr. Dye talked about a little bit. How do you find your asymmetries? Um, you, do, you need a nice dry eyeball. You know, you need someone to watch. With within the school, we were talking about something called the plumb line, where you have um, something that's kind of centered. So like a PVC pipe. I know you guys have those, but you know, bringing that. Uh, I'm just grab one. <laughs> I was gonna grab one earlier, but. Oh, 
but addressing those asymmetries, so having something to, you know, to, to that, that's going to be fixed, you know, so that when you're doing a squat, you have something that's, that's you can tell that you're breaking your form or that kind of thing. Um, looking in the mirror, again, having somebody watch your form and saying, okay, well, your right hip is actually dropping when you do this, like, let's try this, that kind of thing. Um, and then stability before mobility. You absolutely need that core strength um, in the shoulders, like the rotator cuff, that strength before you can actually get the mobility and do things um, like, you know, uh, kettlebell swings and that kind of thing. You need to have that stability of the shoulder to be able to the kettlebell swings. You need that core strength and the, the hip strength to be able to do the squatting and, and the one-legged you know, pistol squats or whatever to be able to keep your form. Um, so you have to work on stability before you can work on mobility. So work on that core strength, that kind of thing. So then going on from there, we all know that we need to stretch warm up, but do it you know, the right way. Don't just go out there. Um, static stretch for five minutes and then okay I stretch my legs and now I'm going to go do an upper body workout. So just make sure that the muscles that you intend to use in your workout are warmed up. So do a static stretch. Get up and do some dynamic movement, arm circles, you know, um, butt kicks, all that good stuff. And then um, always incorporate a cool down. So don't just get down at the gym and then walk out into the angry weather that we're having and, you know, go from there. You need, okay. and with stretching, um, especially before, you need to have your muscles ready to do what you're doing. So having that, that warm up, stretching, doing like a dynamic stretch, and I think that usually from what I've seen with CrossFit gyms, they are pretty good about doing this, but you have to have your muscle ready to move. So just doing a static stretching, well it's not moving, yeah, you're stretching that muscle, but it's not getting that muscle ready to move and do the movements that you're gonna be doing during the wad. So, I mean, you need to do that dynamic stretch and that warm up to get those muscles ready to roll and do what you're gonna do. Um, so there, you know, you gotta make sure that you're not just doing sitting stretches, that kind of thing, that you actually are getting those muscles ready to do the movements. Yeah, so increasing the heart rate. Usually they say you wanna bring a sweat during the warm up. Um, Cause that ensures that you get warmed up properly. Um, and then the other one, we've talked a lot about this today, but it's just mastering the proper technique so, and we'll go into this and we're gonna do some hands-on after this, I know. But um, working with some of the programs I work with with Dr. Dye is all about keeping these movements aligned. So whether you're looking, you know, have somebody, and I know there's a lot of good trainers out here, um, coaches, you can talk to physical therapists, athletic trainers, but just making sure you're doing it correctly. And that's one of the biggest things for preventing injuries is, you know, when you're doing the squat, are you just gonna keep doing this every time? Or are you gonna see, you know, figure out your asymmetries, your imbalances, and how do we correct it? So that you know you can do that that perfect movement, knees over toes, knees straight. You're not out, you're not in, and just keep that consistent is the biggest thing. Is proper technique and doing it consistently, time and time again. So then um, the other one, progress activity slowly. You don't want to go from not doing crossfit at all to jumping in and doing one of the hardest workouts <laughs> ever done. Um, but just start slow. Know your individual goals, and the, the competition can sometimes be you know it's always a good thing. It's, it's someone to keep you motivated, but it can be a bad thing as well is if you see Johnny doing, again, a thousand pound squat, and you're like, oh, I can do that, and jump in there. So just know know your limitations, know your goals, and that's one of the biggest things to progressing your activity is, okay, I'm gonna start here. And I know, I don't know if we've got any you know, long distance runners, but I think a lot of the runners use the 10% 10, 10 rule, so that each week you only increase your distance 10%. So you're not just jumping out there. Have, have goals set up for progressing that activity. Um, and then maintain proper rest days, and we kind of went back and forth on how often should you rest? Um, and, and use your body as a guide there. So if you're dying, if you do two workouts in a row and you're dying that third day, it's probably time for rest. Um, and I know this, a lot of the, the coaches and the trainers can help you with how often should we rest, when and not, you know. That high school girl I was telling you about, she needs to know when to rest. Her body is telling her it's time to rest. So um, I don't know if you have anything to add that from a physical therapy standpoint, but. Um, yeah, from a rehab standpoint, like I, my patients that and the shoulder is very temperamental um, and so if you feel like you you know some a joint or something is, is just bothering you a lot more that that day for whatever reason I usually tell my patients don't do your exercises like you know which is a huge thing like what you know <laughs> don't just don't do it because if you do them just take a couple days off let the body rest 
and then you can jump back into them. But for right now, if you do your exercises on top of it being just really sore and really painful that day, you actually need to take steps backwards. So you really have to maintain the proper rest days. I mean, just kind of think about it as your body as a whole. Like it's a really, really hard workout. It's really kind of over the top sore pain. Like maybe you need to just go in and do some stretching or something because otherwise you can't regress. You know, you're, you got to get your mind around that. You know, like you're not going to regress physically. <laughs> like, or, you know, I'm not going to be in shape and stuff. You're going to regress, you know, physically. Like you're going to have more and more pain and that kind of thing. So. And then um, another, and the one thing I do really like about CrossFit, not that I don't like CrossFit, but um, is there are different movements. So you're not doing the same thing repetitively. So, you know, you'll switch it up day by day, week by week. Um, but another key point, especially in kids that specialize in one sport, so they play basketball year round, that's the only thing they do, is consider cross training. And you can, there are all kinds of ways you can cross train, uh, you know, whether it's yoga or cycling or swimming, just something to offset the stress that you're doing on a daily basis. So if you know if you're an overhead athlete and all you're doing, you're a baseball player, and all you're doing is pitching every day, day after day after day, you know you're going to have that abdominal so shoulder to switch to that. Um, what kind of patients is that? It's not actually them doing you know, the push press or whatever they get uh, picking up the bar. You still got to use the proper body mechanics to pick up the bar, you know. And so even if it's the PVC pipe, because so I told my patients that deal with like disc problems, like. It, what, what's going to happen is you're just going to bend over to pick up your sock, and that's what's going to happen. So it's not necessarily maybe when you're actually doing the workout, and that's one of the huge pet peeves. It's when I see somebody just at the gym just Bellenberg and Bellenberg gates. Um, this is I find this all the time, um, and I, this is me exaggerating. Um, but a Trendelenburg gate is this when your hip drops when you're walking, or you're just on a unilateral and you're on one leg doing squats or anything like that. So your gluteus medius keeps your pelvis level. So when someone's running or doing a one-legged activity, even walking, so my right here, my right side is trying to keep my left side straight. Um, if it's weak, it's going to let this pelvis drop. And if you can see my right leg, then my knee just went in, my ankle just rolled in. Okay, so over time, that puts a lot of stress on what he was asking about the, the trochan tear, bursitis, that kind of side, the bursa. Puts a lot of stress on, on the knee and the kneecap. You get some puts all moral issues. You have, um, and most of the time, you know, ACL injuries and stuff, not gonna probably happen during CrossFit, but that's when you get the, the injuries like from sports, you know, someone just coming in, well, there it goes the ACL, that kind of thing. So gluteus medius is huge um, for, for anybody that does anything on one leg, which is basically all of us, because we walk. So um, we'll be kind of talking about how to strengthen that. Uh, later slides, but gluteus maximus, so making sure that the, a lot of times, especially I, I have found that with CrossFit, a lot most people are quad dominant, and what I mean by that is that they use their quads mostly for, for everything, for running, or, you know, they're all, if you watch elite runners, they all are running like this, with their, their, their feet are almost hitting their, their butts, because they, they use a lot of their gluteus maximus, well, most of us are running like this because we're more quad dominant. Um, so just to counteract that, we need a little bit more gluteus maximus um, strengthening. Um, quad weakness, again, we were talking about, I'm actually more meaning the one, she hit one of the vastus medialis, but a lot of times we do get this, this quad is usually utilized, but it's not the inside. So that is gonna help with that kneecap tracking correctly. Um, and that's a, that, the inside quad of the vastus medialis is very, hard to isolate and strengthen, but that's something to kind of help keep your kneecap um, moving correctly if you, don't, if you have a weakness. Uh, yeah, so and then abdominal weakness, we talked about this. A lot of times so people will, will assume this posture where their abs are, are weak and so they kind of just hinge on their, you know, hinge on their hips because their abs are weak, um, just to keep them stabilized, which imagine loading with a, a weighted bar with that with weak abs, that's just gonna put ton of load on the back. Um, stiffness in the IT band, major. Um, um, stiffness in the hip flexors, that causes a lot of pain in the front of the hip. A lot of times when you're, you're trying to do the squats, it's going to be pinching. Um, you're going to get a little bit of walking like this if they're really stiff. And we do get a lot of that because we're, I mean, a lot of us do sit for jobs. That's what she was talking about. So, um, Stiffness 
the piriformis. This is actually a, a, not the women being captured. How they get a lot of men who have this. Um, they just have really tight hips. It's just kind of how we usually come out of the factory. So. <laughs> um, stiffness in the hamstrings. You guys know that. That causes a lot of back pain, usually because I know it's attached to what she was talking about, where the attachments are and that kind of thing. And then foot over pronation. So we were talking about the kinetic chain. So here's the foot over pronation. The foot rolls in. So if, if I have no problems with my hip or knee, but my foot rolls in all the time, well, there goes my knee already. Um, so that, it's all up and down, down and up. And we'll kind of talk about that with shoe-wise and stuff, um, what that means to you in later slides. So addressing the asymmetries, which I've done a little bit. Um, specific dynamic or static stretches multiple times per day. So. I always tell my clients, I'm like, okay, you come in, you're going to be with me for an hour a week, maybe, you know, um, maybe a little more, a little less, doesn't matter, but what, it's going to be matter what you're going to do at home. So even if you're here three days a week, if you have asymmetries or you're having pain, or even if you're not, if you have asymmetries, you need to continue to work on it on a daily basis, otherwise it's not going to get, it's not going to do you any good. So you have somebody identify that, or you do seem like when you're squatting that you have a little bit of, of a hip, you know, hip drop, this side goes down a little bit more. Okay, well, how am I gonna work on that? Um, you know, trying to figure out where, what needs to be stretched or what needs to be strengthened and doing that um, multiple times per day. Specific strengthening exercises, specific muscles or muscle groups. Um, so this is a picture of band walking. We give this to our patients a lot. Um, and this is a, a really good one for the gluteus medius. And how you know you're working the gluteus medius is you'll feel the, the strain right behind the hip joint, kind of in the butt area. Um, so I don't know if you guys have like little veins or anything, but um, just putting around the ankles and having like a good squat form, good athletic form, and doing some side to side with the band. Um, and making sure you're still in a good position. Don't let the knees come in or anything like that. Keeping that core in tight always. And then you can do some diagonal steps with the band and that kind of thing um, to strengthen the gluteus medius. Um, also some hip hikes do some strengthening the gluteus medius. You can stand on a step or something and just bring that hip up and down. That's gonna get that other side that's planted <coughs> and like I'm already feeling on the other side. That's a good strength there, just easy for the gluteus medius. Um, let's see, functional process movement activities with symmetry in mind. So just making sure that, oh, like, you know, that you're, the wad that you do, I mean, you're, you're individualizing your own programming. So what you are going to do with the movements, maybe not all of you do pull-ups, Maybe, you know, you do something else, but individualizing, so you look at those movements, um, and, and like Dr. Dye was saying, like, squatting is a functional activity. We do it on a daily basis. So, I mean, individualizing all of those and trying to find those asymmetries for what you do for your workouts, what your daily activities are, that kind of thing. Um, looking in the mirror to do that, peer feedback. Again, we already talked about the core and joint stabilization before, you know, making sure that your core is nice and stabilized and, that, and the hips are nice and stabilized before you do any of the other activities or anything um, beyond that. Um, equipment, <coughs> I was more meaning like if you, with proper shoes. And that, uh, this is the thing, I mean, this is also kind of out of my scope practice and I always feel like I'm a shoe salesman with my patients. Um, I think people are going to be like, do you work for ASICs? Or, um, <laughs> it's not, not the case. Um, you know, that's a huge component is, is, again, going from the foot up. So I know that the CrossFit shoes, most of the time, don't have uh, a lot of stability in them. You know, they don't. And there's a reason for that because there's multiple things you're doing. You're running, and then all of a sudden you're jumping, and then you're going to be doing this. And so you have to have some traction on the shoes and that kind of thing. And so. But if you are a person that has flat feet, that is probably is not in your best interest. You know, I mean, um, I don't have good shoes on today. Like they they have zero support in them. Um, so I don't, you know, have that issue. But if you have flat feet, you know, then your foot's going to come in, and that knee is going to come in. So is it a CrossFit shoe? 
sure, but is it good for you? You know, maybe not. Maybe you do need some ASICs that have some um, more of an arch support that's going to always try to help keep that foot into more of a, um, a neutral position so that your knee already has a good chance of being in a more neutral position and, and up the line, up to hip, back, and, up and so forth. So you really have to think about that. Now, if you are doing, if you have to have some type of CrossFit shoe because of something, maybe putting in orthotic in it, over the counter, you know, just being over the counter, um, that helps, helps your arch support. Maybe you're a person that has high arches and you need you know, some support just to help with that. I mean, it's, it, the foot is very complicated and I won't get into that, but, um, and I also don't work for anybody with this, but I, I usually tell my patients like the running center and shields do a pretty good job. And I know the running center specifically, they do a really good job of looking at the person looking at their foot, watching them walk, and they do have a machine, I think, that actually you step on and they can tell, you know, and so it, we, the shoe is a huge component of, of uh, if you're doing the workouts. Um, so. And it's not just the shoe, and I know I work in a clinic with a lot of orthodiatrists, that, and we do tons and tons of custom orthotics. So if you do have flat feet or just foot issues in general, you can even, and not necessarily always the shoe, I mean, shoe, Finding the proper shoe for you is great, but you can get those custom orthotics where they're actually scanned personally to your foot um, that can correct a lot of those issues. So, going along the lines of proper shoes and just proper equipment in general, which I know outside of you think of equipment, you're like, I don't need any braces or anything like that, which you might, but um, custom orthotics is a big one for the shoes because you can take them and have the repair shoes to wear. And there is a difference, like going to, and I don't mean any disrespect to but there is a difference when you go to like shoe carnival and get a pair of ASICs or whatever compared to Shields and that. And I know, like I tell my patients, like, hey, Pete, I'm sorry that I'm telling you that you should spend a lot of money, but it is somewhat of what you pay for. And I mean, if, and if you are, most CrossFitters, they, they're there, they're here a lot, and, you know, working out, so that's important. So <laughs> spend, you know, spend that money to make sure that you have good, you know, overall physical health with your joints and stuff so that you can continue to work out and that kind of thing. It, it's important. And knowing like the amount, you know, I usually say if like you're a runner and you do it a ton, you at least need to change those shoes out six months. Oh, you know, and then they all, oh, but they look fantastic. <laughs> it's like, yeah, they look fantastic on the outside, you know, but you know, it, it's what's going on in the in, inside of the shoe. And it might be worn down and that kind of thing. And a lot of times, some, a lot of the telephomoral pain from overuse, I'm like, well, how long is, how long have you been wearing these shoes for workouts? Like, oh, I've been wearing it for three years. They look fantastic. And I also wear them for, you know, just everyday walking and it's like, just try your, you know, change your shoes out and see, and then and let me know how it goes. And they'll say, oh, the pain's disappeared. You know, and, you know, it, like I said, I'm not a shoe salesman or anything, but having someone look at your foot while you're walking that is specialized in that. Like, I, I have heard Shields does a pretty good job. I, from what I've seen, Dix usually kind of has like a high schooler working. So, you know, they have good shoes, but I don't know that I would have someone walk and walk with that. Um, but making sure that you have a good shoe that's specific to you so that your foot is in good alignment going up the chain. <coughs> and this was just going back to some of the protocols that Dr. Diana had been talking about. And we um, used to work hand in hand in some of the high schools on proper jump training. And I don't want to bore you guys with all of this, but just focusing on the basics. And, you, you know, we would come in and work with these high school kids, you, you know, primarily girls for whatever reason, just because they needed the extra training um, because of that valgus maneuver. But um, you would come in on the first day and they thought they were going to get some kind of a crossfit workout or we were just going to condition them. And we would come out there and we would start with just wall jumps and say, do a wall jump. I'm like, okay, you have no problem. And they do it. And I'm like, oh my God, that's terrible. You're coming down like this. So then just spending a whole day on just correcting that position, whether it's just doing squats or, you know, just jumping off of the bleachers or whatever it is and just correcting that form. And um, we always had a program Pulse Force Metrics where we would like videotape them the very first day and be, you know, come back, train them for four to six weeks and then we'd be able to show them, okay, this is what you look like. And they see themselves on camera like, oh my God, how did I not tear an ACL already? Um, <laughs> but it's just a lot of the basics and it's just spending a whole day just making sure you got the correct one, working with somebody else, seeing yourself, in the <coughs> videotaping yourself is a really good way to do it. Um, and then just progressing. So starting with a wall jump and then <coughs> as simple as that, but starting there and then progressing to a squat jump and then 
bounding, you know, for distance and then side to side, and then one of you jumps, and just combining all of those movements to where you can master that, and then take that into everything else. And we talked about um, doing it consistently, and that's my biggest thing is don't just do it for me while we're at the gym. You know, go home and you're gonna squat down and pick something up, do it the right way, and then you're, you know, you get in that subconscious of just doing it all the time. Um, so this was just a few of the protocols that we used to use that involved all of this and just mastering this. And then proprioception training, I don't know, if, you know, you've probably all heard of that, but proprioception is just kind of knowing where your body is in space. So, you know, if you shut your eyes, you can always sense where your arm is. That's, you're using proprioception to know where your arm is. Um, and so a lot of these are good proprioception exercises um, using like a, a, you know, a balance pillow or a wobble board or anything. And just being able to master that movement, once you've mastered these simple movements, then you can take it here and be able to, you know, do these one-legged out here and you're not dropping down. And just, and we'll kind of go over that when we do the hands-on portion, but just being able to master these and then take this into the functional movements that you're going to be doing. And then also going off of that with the jump progression that Anna kind of piggybacking on, doing them when you're not really thinking about it, like one of my pet peeves with um, some people with CrossFit was like with herpes. Um, you know, not something that you would automatically think like, oh, I'm doing box jumps, I need to have proper form, but when you end your burpees, I don't know how many times I've seen people like come back up and they're like that, you know, they jump and go, okay, you know, you need to have proper form even coming up from the and that kind of thing. There's always making sure of any of those type of moves that you have that proper form. gets inflamed and it becomes painful. So um, anytime there's tightness or weakness, then that bursa is inflamed. So bottom line, whether no matter where the bursa. Would you agree? Oh, yeah. So you guys talked a lot about warming up and the proper warm up. What are your thoughts about as far as like to warm up, like heating? Like I know I played college volleyball and we did a lot of heating right before we would play. Is that something that you guys? Uh, I do a lot of heating in the high school setting with yeah. the um, for STEM too. with the like the high drop and the heat backs, but yeah. I always do that in addition to. So I'll always say you know more so if they're you know nursing an injury if they're really tight for some reason I'll have them heat for ten to fifteen minutes, but that's always in addition to. So you're always going to do the same warm up. Don't do one over the other. So you know heating is a good way to kind of warm it up. You know externally it's not going to do a ton, but it's good to do in addition to. Because then you can do that, they're already a little warm, and then getting out there and actually doing the static stretching and the dynamic movement, it's a good kind of addition. I think the heating, like doing a heat <coughs> heating pad kind of thing before, to me would be only if there's something specific that you need to be, like you are nursing an injury or something, so you, and you're gonna go into a workout that something's really tight, the hip flexor, putting some heat on it so that it's a little warm, but otherwise, technically, if you warming up, like a dynamic stretch and and cardio and that kind of thing for a specific warm up, you're already heating it up. Your body's already heating up. So if you know if there's not anything, not nothing, anything specific that you are trying to address, and I'm I don't want to worry about it. So we had like an hour or so of kind of prepared presentation, and then we thought we would, <clears throat> if you guys had specific questions or body parts, we'll get some bands the PVC tubing and then we can kind of go over some specific exercises that if you had specific questions or if you just want Brittany and Kurt and I to kind of throw some stuff out there. So let me go grab a couple bands. And you I think we got a question. Yeah, oh, yeah I'd yeah, like yeah. to see some of the exercises for the those other muscles in the gluteus. 
the the ones that you were talking about. So, yeah. 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 Sure. Okay. Yeah. We usually like double or triple them up. Oh, okay. I know. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Yeah. It's yeah. Are you doing crab walk? <laughs> yeah. Look. Usually. Sorry. Sorry. Trying to take it out. Yeah, that works too. You could probably even do this. Yep. Um, you want to come up here? <laughs> I'm wearing boots. Uh, <laughs> okay. It still works. What would you wear? Jeans. And jeans. <laughs> um, so if you want to put your feet in like that. To start off with, and then I'm going to twist this, and so your your feet are going to be just a little bit shoulder width apart, or a little bit, yeah. And then you're going to be in a good athletic position, so so not knees coming back, but your through your heels, and then what you're going to and make sure your core is tight, but you're going to just walk, yeah. Yep. My favorite one. <laughs> and again, yep, and, and then keep, maintain that athletic okay. position though, because if you don't, then you guys will usually could lock out their knees and so then their quads aren't engaged too. Okay. So, and if you do, I usually have to do 10 to 15 steps to one side and 10 to 15 steps to the next, and you should feel it kind of in, like I said, the butt hip area. Um, I don't know if this is, because I haven't really done it with these veins like that. I don't know if you can do monster walking with them or not, but I guess you can. So trying to keep maintain some resistance on that band. Um, you can so do some monster walking like the diagonals. Yep, and and you can also have it above the knees as well. And I was gonna, for the clamshell, the one slide. You know, you could do this statically, and I'm really kind of working my butt here. And you can also side to side there, and you're kind of getting external rotation. Try not to let it do this because the band is going to try to drive you there. But you've got to use your external rotators and your abductors to keep that position. So mm -hmm. if it's hard yeah, at first, just do, do you know, even yeah, doing sometimes this against a, a wall, you know, kind of like a wall sit with the band. Yeah, push push the good way. Pushing the knees out and, you know, you'll fatigue pretty quickly yeah. just <laughs> doing static exercise. So that's another way okay. to um, start. I don't know if this one will work. Do you want your feet coming forward or a little out? Yeah. Now. At least neutral, a teeny bit out, like not more than 20 degrees of extra rotation. But it's, you can also do like an Elvis band, so if you have it around the knees, that you know, being in that position, just going in and out like that too. Mm -hmm. We call it the, wide. Yeah, yeah. That's what we're like the Elvis band. <laughs> so, Thank um, you. <laughs> yeah. Oh, absolutely. Oh, and then the other one for the gluteus I was talking about is the hip hikes. So you can do it straight on the floor, just bring that hip up oh, and back okay. down. Or you can stand like on a on a step with one leg and then bring that hip up and back down. Um, do you guys have rollers? Mm -hmm. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, one that's really. Oh, uh, the they, white one. The white one. Yeah. You don't like the pokies, huh? I like it for, but not for this. <laughs> I do like the pokies, but this is another one that I sometimes will have my, my patients do, but the it's at the, the hip, the actual hip joint, the roller is, and then having um, the one leg that's closest to the wall up and then doing the hip up and back down. So you're getting that, like I said, this, this muscle is what it's trying to do is control my pelvis. So lowering it and bringing it back up is a good hip strengthener for the other side. So that's another one that you can do for the glute knee too, if you don't have bands or, or have rollers, whatever. And Brittany mentioned how how hard it is to stretch that IT band, and that's where the foam roller and the hard roller mm -hmm. really comes in handy. That myofascial release, because there's you know friction and tension, and you just can't really stretch it sometimes. If you if you have to. The therapist can knead it out, or at home you can roll it out. Say, like the tendons are like gum, 
you know, or tendons and muscles like gum. They can they can stretch. They, but the IT band is actually I call it kind of like chicken skin. So it's not something that you can just stretch, um, unfortunately. So, but it, it does cause major problems. So I mean, over time you can get a little bit more lengthening of it. Um, but yeah, it's. It's one of those things you just kind of have to need, you know, like rolling on the roller or taking one of those things that she just had that with, the, you know, that really helps to get into it. Um, we have, you know, if people really have issues with our IT band, then we have like people that have special technique in, in our therapy clinic that they, it's more often called like grass and technique, but, or ASEM where they take special tools and really get in there and dig into it and to try to get it loosened up and that kind of thing, or almost more of like changing its structure around um, to try to you know, get off of the, anything that's, that it's snapping over or whatever. So, but really, really important. The best way I have found to kind of stretch it out, but you're getting that what the muscle was that's attached to the IT band, which is in the, the TFL, the tensor fascia lata, um, is doing like a dynamic stretch of, of walking. But so instead of, a lot of people see this as a hamstring one, and that's fine. You can do as a hamstring one, but if you kind of change your angle and going towards the foot that's in the back, then you see how my hip is kind of jetted out. So I'm getting a little bit more of that stretch here. Um, so I have my patients do this kind of like a walking stretch to get that IT band. You'll feel the difference in where you're feeling the stretch. So you feel it on the outside rather than the hamstring. And then switching, of course, to do the other leg. So. And I know we've had a few people that I've seen for patellofemoral pain in this room. Could you each give like your favorite two exercises for patellofemoral pain? And I know it depends person to person. Yeah. It, but in general, the two best exercises for the I'm going to go first because you're more of an expert, so I don't want you to take much. <laughs> <laughs> so I really like the clamshells, which you've all seen. But laying on your side, um, ankles always together, and then you've got the band around your knee, and then you're just opening up one side. And I say with all that, and you probably say the same thing, is go really slow because the band naturally wants to pull you back. Mm -hmm. And all the kids that I have do this, and they're kids, I understand. But they'll just come up and they'll go, yeah, I can do this. And they're just sitting here doing that. So it's controlling it up and then slowly coming back down. So you're doing concentrically and eccentrically and doing it on both sides. Um, and then the other one is called terminal knee extensions. So with a band, um, I'm going to do it on you because. So then you're going to start with your knee bent. And then you're going to go against the resistance to straighten out. Okay, and then you're just going to do this for repetition, so like three sets of ten, um, generally. And that kind of, you know, you're working the quad there. You're doing a little bit on the hamstring as well, and that's just kind of help, helping to strengthen all the way around the patella. So those are my two favorites. So. <laughs> um, well, like I was talking about, the inside quad muscle is extremely hard to isolate, and a lot of research shows that you can't. Um, but. I actually have a lot of my patients, you know, going back to the old Jane Fonda days, um, uh, of doing, you know, how you can you're doing the straight leg raises, um, but try to get a little bit more of the inside quad so that you're pulling that kneecap a little bit more into the central area, because usually they kind of want to come out. So trying to pull that back into the middle um, of doing the straight leg raises, but your, your leg is rotated a little outward. And if you have a slight knee bend, just a tiny knee bend, then it gets a little bit more of the quads, so you're not locking it out. So slight knee bend and the outward rotation, then you can kind of get a little bit more of that inside muscle. You can already see I'm shaking, so. Um, so just get, and you can always put ankle weights to make it a little harder, um, but getting to get that inside. And even you can do the uh, an isometric one too, or having it kind of be on the outside, and then you can even put your fingers on that inner part of your leg, not totally where the seam of your pants is, but kind of right in the middle, and then just kind of feel, trying to tense that muscle up right underneath your fingers, holding that for five seconds to try to get that inside quad muscle, like I said, to try to keep that kneecap centralized. Those are like the ones I usually start my patients on with the telephomoral, so. And that's like to strengthen it so that, to just prevent. Yeah, because like she said, the, the kneecap's a floating bone, so, um, it has to, it's, it's relying on all the muscles and everything to keep it, to keep it tracking correctly. So, and that's what patellofemoral usually is, it's just not tracking correctly. Um, it's usually tracking on the outer part or whatever. So, getting that, I guess this is a, 
There we go. There we go. Yeah. So I have like an annotation. But so you have all the forces of what kept, keeps that kneecap tracking correctly. So you need to get that inside quad muscle to help keep it centralized. Now, so he was doing like a, a glute med strengthener is what he likes to help again going on the kinetic chain to make sure that the knee isn't wanting to come inside, which can always cause that the telephone So those are important as well, but to directly attach to the, the kneecap. That's why I usually like to get that inside quad muscle to help pull that back. And then of course doing like glute, glute med strengthening, glute max and stuff to kind of unweight the kneecap too. So, yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, so if we develop like something that just stays sore for a month or more, so, like right now I have like an issue right back here. So when I do like high knee jumps or whatever, I can feel it like s the stress on it. So what do we do when we, have an injury we us we know to watch for these things but what well kind of, a general rule if, it, if you have an acute injury or you feel something <coughs> pop or you have swelling you probably get that checked but if it's something that's kind of insidious or gradual onset like that where something's aching a month is getting to be out there usually you know two three weeks but first i'd meet with your trainer and, and kind of describe and have them look and see if there's something some flaw that might be the cause of it, you know, work on a little bit. But if it's usually about, we say, two, three weeks, if something's nagging, it's kind of becoming a little more chronic, then I'd get in and get it checked. And, and a lot of times it's something that a physical therapist can give you a couple things and, you know, then work with the trainer in the gym and continue on that path. So I would, I would definitely say stop doing whatever is bothering it for a while. I mean, you know, because if you do feel like, okay, well, high knees are bothering it and that kind of thing, well, something's aggravating it. So give it a good couple of weeks without that. Again, this is out of my scope of practice, but I usually tell if you have no issues with medication, maybe take like a thing of Aleve, eat or, you know, some Aleve throughout. And you, like I said, this is more of your scope of practice, but keeping no, it in your, in your system. Short course of yeah, short course, like taking Aleve a couple times a day, a couple, couple couple times a day throughout the entire week to keep it in your system see if that anti-inflammatory mm -hmm. plus some ice and then maybe you doing some soft just like kind of working on massaging it mm -hmm. and then avoiding that exercise and see if that helps first um, and then gradually again getting back into those exercises that did bother it and then if it doesn't improve then yeah it's probably something that it's okay let's get it looked at and see go from there and being an athletic trainer out of the school, I don't have all the x-rays and MRIs and all that good stuff that they have. They're just trying to isolate the injury. So like what, what ca what's, what's causing it to hurt and why? So they're just trying to isolate that problem. And then once you've isolated the problem, then you can try to sort of fix it. Sometimes back there can be actually like sciatic stuff or nerve stuff too. So you kind of have to watch that. Uh, dealing with labral tears, if you're dealing with a lot of popping in your hip joints, is it muscle weakness or, I mean, how do you correct that? It, and you said hip joint in both sides? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and have you been diagnosed? And I'm less labor? than 30 years old. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Have MRI. Diagnosed? Have you actually been diagnosed? Yeah, both labral tears. And you have mechanical popping? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I mean, and they, I assume they probably tried some physical therapy first. Yeah. And injection? No injection. No yet. injection. And, and with the popping, you're getting to be more of the situation which may end up needing surgery because that's the mechanical, if there's something, a labral tear that's sort of popping, moving back and forth. But um, if it's a mechanical friction process, that still could be addressed with therapy. Injection sometimes calms down the inflammation enough. So I think it's just probably whatever your physician is telling you, follow that path. and. and maximize the conservative care and if it doesn't get better than surgery to yeah. either reset or repair that labral or if there's impingement sometimes it's even more involved than just you know trimming it and yeah. that sort of thing so and it's generally not it generally doesn't hurt but it's like it's loud and it's not like a gunshot going and on. The, uh, you know, that's the research that is that it's like most popping are totally benign, you okay. know, that it's nothing. So if it, there's no pain associated with it, it, even though it's annoying and it's like kind of gross, it's so many things well, can cause yeah. popping. I mean, you know, knuckles, that's just more of like a joint releasing air. It can be yeah. a tendon popping over prominence. I mean, we mentioned the iliopsoas muscle. That's a very common, actually non-painful popping in a hip may not even be your labrum if it's non-painful. 
that that iliopsoas tendon can kind of snap over there, right over the pelvic rim. So, you know, again, like she said, it's if you not, don't have pain with it's it, not painful. Then well, it's not, not painful when it pops. Right, right. So I, I so I mean by that, by that. <laughs> then what I mean by that. So don't like hone in on the popping thing. Okay. If if it's not painful when it pops, like I I battled with IT band friction syndrome, so when it popped over, I like wanted to just like drop to my knees because that was painful popping. But if it's not painful, then I wouldn't, you know, so much worry about like, oh man, I'm, you know, stuff's being ruined right yeah. now, you know. Um, but there's so many things that cause popping that it's hard to everybody. Oh, I, it's like a question I get out of daily, you know, like, what is this popping though? That could be a million different things. So, and you know, in fact, I'm not, you know, like love chiropractors and that stuff, but that's that they do for a lip, you know, a lot of them is pop patients, you know, and so that, you know, that's a good popping, hopefully. You know, and that a lot of popping relief, really, it um, gives you endorphins from the popping. That's why people get addicted to popping their knuckles and that kind of stuff. So some, it's not all bad. So even like even when you hear your knees crunching and stuff, everybody's like, oh my gosh, you know. Actually, research shows that that isn't, and it doesn't really matter either. So as long as it's not painful. So. We kind of allotted 10.45 as earning time, but we'll hang around a little bit longer if you guys are good with that. And uh, we appreciate you coming. Thank you so much. <laughs> Do you have contact information for oh. people, things like that? Yes, um, we're all three at the Springfield Clinic and uh, springfieldclinic.com is our website. And um, 528-7541 is the phone number. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Which one? How's that? Which one? Um, I'm at Springfield Clinic First, which is 800 North First, and uh, I'm at my own, we're at our own separate building, I mean, some of us, but I'm at the main physical therapy hub that's like down by, on South 6th Street. Um, that's where Kurt's, north of Kurt's kind of a I'm, migrant. I'm Walker everywhere <laughs> in town, but I'm usually at 800 working with the doctors, and then I also am the athletic channel of the high school. So, awesome. Yeah. yeah, give us a call or, you know, email. I have a dhillard symbol at springfieldclinic.com is my work email, so I don't check it every day, so don't expect an answer. <laughs> and you brought some cards and stuff, oh, yeah, right? I did. I brought some bio cards and, and a little handout that I had written actually for um, Fletcher asked me to write something on his last year so it's kind of basic of hip mechanics and uh some free pens you can have a yay <laughs> <laughs> all right thank you thank, thank you, you.